On January 15th, 2022, at 5.15 p.m. local time or 4.15 a.m. coordinated universal time, a submarine volcano in the Tongan archipelago erupted, causing not only a giant ash cloud and atmospheric shock wave, but also a tsunami that was detected by measuring stations all around the Pacific Ocean. I'm going to look at that tsunami's propagation, but first let's get a little background. The Tongan archipelago is one of the most seismically active regions on Earth. It sits on top of a so-called subduction zone, where two tectonic plates push into each other, and one of them is squeezed underneath the other one, back into the Earth's mantle. In this case, it is the Pacific plate coming from the east that is pushed under, or subducted, by the Indo-Australian plate from the west. If we look at a map of past earthquakes from that region, drawn at the proper 3D positions in Earth's interior, we can see them outlining the location of that plate, which used to be ocean floor, as it very slowly melts back into the mantle. Here, we can trace the Pacific plate descending into the mantle at an angle of approximately 60 degrees and reaching a depth of about 660 kilometers or 410 miles. Now let's get back to the volcanic eruption and the tsunami it caused. I wanted to plot the observed arrival times of the tsunami in different places around the Pacific Ocean and compare it to a very simple propagation model that has the wave moving as a circle of expanding radius around its origin point. So where can we find observed tsunami arrival times? Fortunately, there is a global network of tidal gauge stations operated by the International Oceanographic Commission, which is part of UNESCO, and a web interface allowing the public to access it. This is the main portal, showing a map of stations that have data available. Clicking on any of the green dots opens a page with detailed information about the selected station, including plots of recent sea level measurements. This is what such a plot looks like during a normal day, showing the regular sequence of two high tides and two low tides per 24 hour period. And this is what it looked like on the day after the volcanic eruption. We can see the sudden change in pattern as the tsunami arrives. I accessed the sea level data of 30 such stations and extracted arrival times by finding the threshold between regular and irregular patterns. Here are the 30 stations whose data I used, drawn as green dots, and the location of the volcano drawn as a red dot. I can now use the time slider to scroll through, or playback, the 14 hours following the eruption. The color of each station will turn from green to red at the time it recorded the tsunami's arrival. In addition, the modeled wavefront will be drawn as an expanding red circle around the volcano's location, with the circle's radius, measured along Earth's spherical surface, calculated by multiplying time since the eruption with a constant speed of about 210 meters per second. If the model is accurate, stations should change color right at the moment when they are passed by the moving circle. So let's see it. Pay close attention to when each station changes color. While we are doing that, I want to emphasize that while the wave moves at 210 meters per second, which is 756 kilometers per hour or 470 miles per hour, the actual water is not moving anywhere near that speed. In fact, each bit of water that is neither very close to the wave's origin nor very close to a shore is only moving vertically, quite slowly at that, and not at all horizontally. In other words, a tsunami or any ocean wave moves through the deep water, the water does not move along with it. This only changes when the tsunami reaches a shore, then the suddenly rising water level will push large volumes of water inland, causing destruction. From what we just saw, a circular wave expanding at a constant speed is a very simple and yet surprisingly decent model of a tsunami that propagates primarily through deep water. All stations observed arrival times were within plus minus 10 minutes or so from the model's prediction. Those discrepancies are primarily due to two factors. First, it is sometimes hard to pinpoint the exact arrival time from sea level measurements as I did. Not all plots exhibit as clear a signal as the one I showed. And second, the propagation speed of a real wave is not constant but depends on several factors, most importantly water depth. The Pacific Ocean is generally deep enough that the simple model is close but the real wave will move faster through very deep regions and slower through shallows. That is, of course, the reason why oceanographic agencies do not use models as simple as this one, but the downside of those accurate models is that they, unlike this one, require advanced knowledge of hydrodynamics to understand. 